Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week on the show, we're featuring an interview that I did recently with Sona, an anarcho-feminist from Yerevan, Armenia, about her experience of anarchism and some of the solidarity efforts related to supporting Armenians expelled from Nagorno-Karabakh, an Armenian enclave within the borders of neighboring Azerbaijan. For further information on the subject, consider checking out recent Crime Think articles that we'll be linking in the show notes. Who is Jorge Esquivel El George? Hola, compa, soy El George, preso político secuestrado en el reclusorio desde hace 10 meses. Miembro activo de la Cupa Che en la Ciudad de México, preso político por un montaje orquestado por la UNAM y el gobierno de este país en todos sus niveles. He is an artisan, a cook, and an anarchist who has been part of the punk community and different squads since growing up on the streets of Mexico City from a very young age. Jorge has always organized in solidarity with many social and political movements, which he often does by cooking large amounts of food to support actions, encampments, or squats, or to raise money for affinity collectives and communities in struggle. Why is Jorge being held captive by the state at the Reclusorio Oriente prison? A setup was organized by the UNAM officials with the complicity of the local and national levels of the Mexican government and media that sought to criminalize the political activity of the Ocupache squad by creating a false narrative of the space being used as a decoy for organized crime and drug dealing. And they used Jorge as the scapegoat. On February 24, 2016, Jorge was detained by plainclothes officers in an arbitrary arrest a few steps outside of the university campus grounds. He was tortured and taken away in an unmarked vehicle, creating fear amongst his friends and compas that he had been forcefully disappeared. In the following days, he was first brought to a federal prison in Miahuatlan, Oaxaca, on falsified charges of drug dealing and then he was transferred to the federal prison in Hermosillo, Sonora, both of which were illegal actions due to the fact that those prisons are exclusively for prisoners who have been sentenced. The officers who filed the charges against him claimed that he was carrying a backpack that contained large amounts of different drugs that he was supposedly selling. Witnesses te testified that he was not even carrying a backpack and forensics testing proved that no fingerprints of his were found on the backpack or on any of the different baggies or packages of drugs they claimed belonged to him. During the following weeks, through actions of solidarity in different parts of the world, his lawyer was able to travel to Hermosillo and defend Jorge against the fabricated charges against him. He was able to get the charges reduced to simple possession and Jorge was released on bail on March 9, 2016. On December 8, 2022, Jorge was again detained by plainclothes officers in unmarked vehicles at this exact same location on the same charges and brought to the Reclusorio Oriente prison in Mexico City, where he has been held for over 10 months. The legal process has again been plagued with the same irregularities that the case had to begin with, and on several occasions his hearings have been postponed, often for months at a time. In August, his final hearings took place and the judge was supposed to close the legal proceedings and move on to sentencing. At that last hearing, Jorge was asked to either desist from his formal complaint with the Human Rights Commission of having been tortured by public servants or wait out the time needed in order to process the complaint in prison, which would mean up to another year and a half. 
Jorge made the decision to desist from his complaint, but shortly afterwards, the judge asked his lawyers on repeated occasions to talk to the, him again and make sure that he wanted to stick with that decision. During this time, the wheels were set in motion to find a way to drag out the case even longer, which is a very common practice with political prisoners in Mexico so as to keep them in jail as long as possible. After the lawyers complied with the judge's orders, Jorge received notification that he was scheduled for another hearing on October 23, 2023, that would set the legal process back several months to the evidentiary phase and require the presence of the arresting officer and Jorge's witnesses in order to give their testimonies in court once again. What can we do in, solidar in solidarity with Jorge? We call upon you all to demand that Jorge be released immediately and that all charges against him be dropped. If you are in Mexico City, come to the Reclusorio Oriente prison on Monday, October 23rd at 9 a.m. to protest outside of the courthouse. If you are in other parts of the world, we call upon you to agitate and organize in solidarity with our compañero by making his case visible, contacting your local embas Mexican embassy or consulate to demand he be released immediately, and any and all of the other ways our creativity and dignified rage are able to manifest in his support. Agradezco a toda la banda que está organizando para venir al juzgado este 23 de octubre al mitin y agradezco a toda la banda de otros lados por la agitación y los actos de solidarios con mi caso. Gracias a todos, libertad a todos los presos políticos y comunes. Down with all prison walls, free George now. My name is Sona. I'm from Armenia, but currently I live in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, I prefer to she, her pronouns, uh, and I consider myself as an uh, anarcho-feminist. Can you please speak a little bit about how you came to your anarcho-feminist or just wider anarchist politics, uh, maybe how they developed into anarcho-feminism, if that's the trajectory, and a bit about the anarchist movement, um, in Yerevan, where you had lived previously, or in Armenia, specifically? I think that I was uh, born into a very leftist family, because, <laughs> as you know, Armenia was part of Soviet Union, and uh, my fam family used to live with uh, my grandparents, uh, who were uh, members of Communist Party and uh, work in uh, various ministries. So my Grandpa, who raised me as a child before school, uh, he talked to me really very much. And uh, instead of some fairy tales, he told me about some communist uh, people, for example, uh, Clara Zetkin or Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was raised into a very liberal family. Uh, n uh, nobody told me no because you are a girl, which which is very... Uh, widely in other Armenian families. Uh, and uh, when I started to go to school, to university, I saw that uh, some girls are very, you know, they have secondary roles, secondary parts, even in their families. For example, family will give more money to educate a son than a daughter. And... Uh, very sad things like this <laughs> and i was come on it is not right <laughs> and i was uh, more reading about liberal feminism uh, i started to read uh, simone de Beauvoir, and uh, later in um, 2017 it was uh, 100th anniversary of uh, russian revolution and uh, uh, on Russian TV, there were many TV shows about uh, Trotsky, Lenin, and uh, I'm a history fan. I started to watch all these TV shows, and uh, it was very interesting because, as you know, Russian TV is more about propaganda, is uh, more about to say, oh, 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 
all these revolutionaries, they are very stupid, they are very too ambitious. We need some uh, firm leader like Stalin, uh, in brackets Putin. Uh, and uh, except of that, uh, in my house, uh, there were various conversations about that cause. Uh, TV was saying one point, uh, grandma was saying second point, dad was uh, considering uh, other point of view. And I started to read articles about the revolution, about uh, revolutionaries. Um, and very soon, all that the articles became books. And uh, at that time, I was studying uh, filmmaking in university, and I decided to make a little documentary film about Trotsky. And uh, from that time, I was considering myself just as a leftist, maybe socialist. But um, last year I moved to Tbilisi and uh, I, I was very bored. <laughs> uh, and I just saw a lecture about uh, Emma Goldman and uh, Alexander Berkman. I went to that lecture and I just uh, fell in love. I started to read everything that I can find uh, about them, about their texts. Uh, then I started to read the other anarchists. And uh, I think uh, it was the start. <laughs> nice. And in that um, <clears throat> in that lecture, were they talking about? I mean, I'm sure it was a, a lot of. They did a lot, both of them, during their lives. I guess did they did they speak about their experiences when they were pushed out of the United States and went back to or visited the Soviet Union, which they hadn't seen since the revolution and and. The experiences that they had there at the time yeah sure uh, this lecture was about uh, not only biographical part but also about their uh, texts uh, their ideas and i was uh, amazed because it was uh, nothing like uh, everything that i knew uh, before that um, and the uh, idea of uh, liber uh, positive total freedom was very uh, surprising for me <laughs> and uh, after that uh, sometime after that lecture I moved back to Yerevan because uh, I had some uh, problems with my job with my family and uh, there uh, in Yerevan there is a cafe it's called Mama Jan uh, and uh, its owner uh, is a Jewish woman from Ukraine. Uh, she moved about 10 years ago to Armenia and she's an anarchist too. And uh, all her life uh, she was dreaming about having an anarchist club or a little movement. Uh, and uh, I got united with her and we started our little club anarchist. It was um, for the first time it was just a reading group. Uh, and uh, other anarchists uh, came to us. Uh, and after that, we started to do our own uh, lectures, uh, also meetings. Uh, we started to participate in uh, political rallies with other uh, liberal parties. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, one of the first uh, anarchist club in clubs in Armenia for a long, long time. <laughs> you can't see me because we've got our cameras off, but I'm, I'm smiling very much like that. That sounds like a <laughs> development. Uh, I've been in reading groups also with people when it's felt like I've been around areas where there aren't many anarchists and having a place that people can come together to, whether or not they're sure about their identity or if they've been thinking in this way for a long time, it's still a nice place to share ideas and share space and, and build solidarity between people. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. That sounds really cool. Yeah, uh, sure. And uh, sorry, <laughs> not all uh, that people who were coming to our club uh, were anarchists and uh, we were learning from each other to be more open, more tolerant uh, and so on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It sounds like you're a little bit newer towards anarchism uh, or your identification with it. Maybe you came into contact with anarchists. Be Is that right? You had said that it, this was maybe in the last couple of years that you had started 
coming like started paying attention to it and started identifying yourself as one is that right yeah i started to identify myself as an artist last year <laughs> um well if you could speak a little bit about what sort of um what the community or what the milieu um if you know that term like just the sort of scene or uh constellation of anarchists in Yerevan or in Armenia, what that was like when you experienced it, if there were certain tendencies that you noticed, or if it was pretty disparate or pretty solid, like it had been there for a while. I'm kind of, I'm curious about what anarchism looks like in Yerevan and what it's like in Armenia to your experience. Uh, unfortunately, we can't say that uh, we have a movement uh, anarchist uh, movement. It's just a bunch of uh, people. <laughs> uh, mostly they are uh, Russians who escaped the uh, Putin regime because of a war in Ukraine, because of mobilization, which was uh, in September last year. And uh, most of them, uh, they are not practicing uh, anarchism. They are just uh, reading books, trying to educate themselves. Uh, and it was the uh, most uh, disappointing point for me because nobody is doing anything. And for me, uh, anarchism is not uh, uh, something academical. Uh, it's about uh, action. And I was wondering, where is that action? Please give me. <laughs> because anar for me, anarchism is uh, much more vivid and alive than uh, reading some texts of um, hundred years old birdy man, <laughs> which are, which seems so dusty sometimes. <laughs> Come on, yeah, we're sure. not Marxists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sometime after uh, our club started, uh, and uh, I want to notice that I'm only a local person in that club, <laughs> only Armenian person in that club. <laughs> so I'm a national minority in my own city. <laughs> Um, um, another Armenian man, he just uh, came along uh, and he introduced himself as a guy who was a refugee from Baku. Uh, as you know, uh, no, Armenians were, <laughs> were li living uh, across uh, Azerbaijan in Soviet Union and before that. And uh, from collapsing Soviet Union, many Armenians just relocate to Armenia because it was very uh, harmful to stay there. Uh, there were uh, pogroms and uh, a little genocide. So, and uh, that uh, man, he relocated to Armenia in the uh, late 1980s and uh, he saw that the government does nothing, uh, that the uh, United Nations just built a couple of houses for the refugees and nothing. They don't, Nowadays, they don't even have electricity or water. They got it like once a day for an hour and uh, they have no money, no job, nothing. Just all that uh, house is far from Yerevan. And uh, he heard that uh, we're anarchists and uh, we know how to cooperate and he decided to do it uh, in that uh, little uh, district. Uh, he started to unite uh, people who live there, uh, that are uh, refugees from Azerbaijan. And uh, we started to work with each other. It means that uh, there are a lot of uh, empty flats and uh, many of the Russian relicates uh, started to live there. And uh, now we, uh, they started to grow something together to do some projects. And in that Cafe Mamajan, we started to do some events and all money we are giving to that people. Yeah, that's awesome. So is this... Is this related to an article that I saw recently on Crime Think about a squatting movement in Armenia and refugees being able to take space and share together? Or is this a separate instance? No, it's a separate thing, uh, which happened uh, far before the uh, Artsakh thing that happened in this September. So you mentioned there being a lot, like a lot of the people that you work with right now are anarchists who are from Russia. Uh, living abroad. And I guess because there are so many people who are from other countries that are in the anarchist community that you're in, does that mean that you have 
sort of live connections to people that are anarchists in neighboring countries, like in Russia or in Georgia, where you're at? I know a lot of also Russian people moved there of various political stripes in order to avoid having to get pulled into the military. And there's a, like a thriving, I know that there's a lot of conflict historically with Turkey for, you know, because of the genocide that they perpetrated against Armenians, but there's also an anarchist movement there and that's a neighboring country. Do you communicate much with anarchists across borders? Well, um, in the Armenia itself, uh, we had uh, something like anarchist movement in uh, 2000, uh, but uh, as uh, they say, they, they grow up and uh, some of them even get uh, jobs in the parliament, <laughs> which in government, which is kind of uh, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and now it is just a bunch of uh, Russian guys who escaped the uh, Putin regime. And in Georgia, things are much better because in Georgia, population is more radical, more political. And um, all Tbilisi is uh, in graffitis connected with uh, anarchism. They even have a little uh, publishing, which published, uh, for example, Kropotkin in Georgian. And uh, it is very popular here because, uh, no. Georgia's uh, population is bigger and uh, uh, youth is more free than in Armenia. Uh, but uh, as I know, uh, Georgians uh, are not communicating uh, to Russians, even if they are anarchists, because again, it, it comes from history. Georgians are don't like uh, Russians at all, uh, because they co even call uh, Soviet times uh, times of occupation uh, and uh, they are strictly uh, strictly negative to Russians. Uh, what about uh, Turkish anarchists? Uh, there are certain ones, but uh, I have spoke one of them. And uh, I was asking, uh, are you helping to Kurdish movement or other anarchists in uh, Azerbaijan or Armenia? Because we are in one region, we are anarchists, we should fight against um, governments. And uh, they were no. And... Uh, that's all. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are more connections with Russian anarchists than uh, other countries in our region. There was a group a few years ago. I don't know how active they are, but I happened to visit um, Istanbul and was able to interact with folks with Devmerici anarchists Fadiat, I think, DAF. And they were doing work with the Kurds in Bakur, but... I don't know. They they were getting repression also because they were publishing a newspaper with issues around um, the Kurdish struggle and had a lot of Kurdish membership too. But so one thing that I understand, and this isn't on the script of questions, but uh, one thing that I understand from anarchist comrades who have gone to Georgia is that while it may be more tolerant towards left organizing in general and anarchism, it is pretty repressive when it comes to sexuality and i imagine like toward against homosexuality queerness and i wonder if that extends towards just gender equality do you find any more or less difficulty than what you experienced in armenia and does it seem like a an issue that will take a lot of organizing around the anarcho-feminism well uh, in in armenia women have all uh, rights civil rights but under that it is even worse than in some islamic countries for example in armenia we have a tradition it's called the red apple it uh, means that uh, after marriage a girl uh, should be a virgin bef before marriage and after marriage all her relatives and family are gathering in her new husband's house and they are waiting and uh, if she was virgin before marriage uh, her husband is giving her father a basket of red apples which is verifying that uh, everything was all right jeez <laughs> uh... <laughs> it, it is 21st century for god's sake <laughs> and uh you know, in Ar Armenians have very big noses, <laughs> and uh, first uh, very popular uh, surgery is about uh, making nose a bit uh, 
smaller and second most popular surgery is about to put a um, uh, girl back virgin <laughs> oh man um yeah 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 i mean and, the united uh, states has lots of lots of similar it's a yeah and uh, even in my university for example we have some intellectual quiz intellectual game and um I started to play in it, <laughs> and very soon I become uh, became a captain, uh, and my team was very successful. And uh, traditionally, that game is um, um, about uh, men. Uh, all men are leaders in that uh, game. And when I became a leader myself, uh, they were gossiping that uh, I'm a whore <laughs> uh, just because I wanted to do something mine inside of that movement <laughs> yeah it sounds like some jealousy issues right there yeah yeah but so you have a you have a trivia team i think you might say in in the u.s and you compete with other trivia quiz teams and uh yeah yeah, yeah win prizes and things mm-hmm Nice. Yeah, and uh, very soon my team became uh, more su successful than uh, all these t teams in my university, <laughs> which were, uh, you know, uh, held by guys. <laughs> I guess going back to that question, though, you've lived in Georgia before, you said briefly, at least. Is there room for people to do organizing around gender and sexual equality issues there? I don't know if you also think about those two things about uh, the ability to love and have sex as you want to, and also gender oppression uh, or resisting gender oppression. If feminism and sexual liberation are allied movements there, but does that seem like a thing that people are pushing in Georgia or is it pretty repressive or pretty okay for people to just be be there oh you know in georgia it is uh, much more better because they had their own sex sexual revolution in the uh, 1990s and of course in some villages uh, in province it is much more stricter but tbilisi is like a new berlin of caucasus <laughs> and uh it's totally free. They have big uh, techno culture, and uh, most famous DJs from Europe came come here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I moved to Tbilisi last year just to get separate from my parents <laughs> because I was forbidden. Uh, I had a good salary, so I can live by myself rent a flat but my dad said no because you are not married and I don't uh, let you to live separate in Yerevan so I just rent a flat in Tbilisi <laughs> and moved. Yeah, we were talking about that before do the parents of unmarried women have say in the renting of spaces like that or is it pressure within the family that like could they talk to the landlord and say this is inappropriate? No, landlords, uh, landlords uh, themselves will ask if you come to want and if you want to rent their uh, apartment. Like, uh, are, are you from another city? Are you here studying? And if I say no, I'm from Yerevan. I just want to separate from my parents. They will so say no. I'm not renting you that flat. <laughs> Damn, crazy. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so. I guess moving forward in the questions, so I'm going to, this is kind of a, a, a bigger subject and I had contacted you or we had agreed to talk while the uh, Azerbaijani military was surrounding and actively attacking Nagorno-Karabakh. So this, this is one reason that we had been in contact, but so correct me if I get any of this wrong, um, as you see fit. But so humanitarian crisis and ethnic cleansing has been occurring in the disputed territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, a majority ethnic Armenian enclave within the borders of the neighboring country of Azerbaijan. In the last century, there have been a number of pushes by ethnic Armenians to live there and create an autonomous zone. And two wars have been fought since this time around the end of the USSR and after over whether the area would be incorporated into Azerbaijan or be recognized as the Republic of Artsakh or be annexed into Armenia. 
and this long period has seen forced expulsions of ethnic Azeri and Armenian minorities from within both the neighboring countries and around the Nagorno-Karabakh and surrounding districts. Since the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, in which Azerbaijan triumphed, the situation of Armenians in the region has been increasingly dire, especially since the December 2022 blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh by the Azerbaijani military, which was claimed to be an anti-terror operation uh, that has led to the starvation and death of civilians and the promise of a possibly fake humanitarian corridor in which people could escape. There's a lot that I'm brushing over and also ignorant of in this situation, but my understanding is that since the end of September of 2023, the Armenian population has been expelled with what they could carry across the border into Armenia. And Azerbaijan now holds the territory fully with the collapse of the Artsakh Defense Forces and Artsakh Republic government. Is that about an okay explanation of the situation? Did I miss anything? Yeah, you are totally right. (laughs) And uh, in uh, very details. And uh, I just want to add something uh, uh, that... uh, situation which uh, broke in early October this year. I consider it a very anarchist uh, gesture because like uh, 100,000 people just woke up and say we are going, we are not ready to live under this government, under these people. And uh, they uh, gather everything and just left their houses, their everything, uh, their pets, and uh, moved to Armenia. But I think many of them won't stay in Armenia. They they will move rather than Russia or Europe or other countries. And was that, so these are people that were, uh, this is at the end of the siege that was happening in Nagorno-Karabakh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, siege, siege was uh, so many months, and uh, then Azeri army started to bombing uh, Stepanakert and the rest of Artsakh. Then they stopped, and uh, they said, uh, like, uh, you can uh, stay here, we will integrate you in Azerbaijan, but it means a genocide, because, like, <laughs> uh, they have very strong and very... Uh, a very strict uh, propaganda, uh, like uh, Azeri propaganda says that every Armenian uh, family has a uh, Azeri slave <laughs> in their houses. Wow. Okay. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, it is not just like a propaganda which are which is in TV, and the uh, population is p- believing in it. <laughs> so for the people that would stay, I'm sure. I'm sure they would experience a lot of, like, all these things would be different. No, they just uh, will be killed in the end. Mm. Uh, They will be tortured and killed, unfortunately. And I know that, uh, like, a couple of hundred people stayed there because, uh, for example, they were very old to leave or uh, they're waiting some. some relatives which are lost uh, or some people just stayed because because of their principles so they are saying no it's my land i'm i'm staying here but it's a suicide well you were still in yaravan when we started talking you were doing aid efforts right you were working in with refugees is that correct yeah, from the first day of uh, bombing uh, Stepanakert, many foundations started to uh, gathering humanitarian aid. Uh, we were collecting food mostly and uh, clothes because winter is coming. And uh, like uh, it was a very big job and uh, many Russian people who are just living in Armenia, and it is not their problem at all. They were helping even more than some Armenians, and it uh, made me very proud that we have very good guests in our country, actually, <laughs> which are taking all that problems to very uh, close to their hearts. And it uh, means really much for me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I'm sure a lot of them had a similar feeling, even if the 
the experience of it was different than what the people coming to Armenia now um, yeah. from Azerbaijan are experiencing. But, you know, having to leave your home, feeling like the threat of, yeah, l- living in exile, you know, that's that's got to be overwhelming. Did you do personal interactions, like checking any medical checks on people that were coming back? Or did you have a chance to talk to many folks that were returning from the other side of the border? Yeah, uh, first days I was just helping in uh, for one of those foundations. It was in a cafe in the center of Yerevan. We just announced that we are collecting everything there because it's a known place and uh, it was uh, easier to people just to come there. But uh, some days after, when uh, refugees already were in Armenia, I just uh, went to one of the cities, which were which was a transition. Uh, city for them and uh, it was really really hard because uh, one thing is uh, you know collecting some food rice and etc in fancy place in Yerevan uh, laughing with friends and other thing is seeing all that people which uh, you know, just uh, escaped in their only slippers with no nothing or just bunch of things so uh, it was really hard emotionally, and uh, I tried to support them and just did everything that was required. And uh, one grandma who was from a village near Stepanakert, she just said that the uh, Azeri army came to that village. They shot uh, her husband and uh, said to everyone else, you have uh, 30 minutes to go. Like, uh, if you live there for generations what can you take in 30 minutes (laughs) yeah absolutely the final straw is a proud member of the channel zero network of anarchist podcasts and here's a jingle from another member of czn are you tired of listening to western experts talking how the world works is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists? For activists. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. Because of the proximity of these two, of this, of where this conflict was and how fresh the wounds are for people that are moving back across the border inside of Armenia, have you seen much in the way of um, a reaction against Azeri people that have been living in Armenia? Like a sort of um, any anger towards people that also, you know, are of that descent? Oh, we we don't have Azeri people in Armenia. We have Armenians refugee from Azerbaijan. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I was reading was talking about since the since the end of the Soviet U- Union and because of the conflicts around around the Gorn Karabakh and I'm sure around other or Artsakh and around other places where people were cohabitating the sort of like expulsion of people or the you know people live leaving from one country to another in some instances like there had been a lot of um, from the end of the Soviet Union uh, you know a lot of Azeri people who were living in the borders of Armenia as well as Armenians living in various parts of Azerbaijan but those populations sort of crossing the border back into the the republics like that they would be identified with. Is it just that people chose to, like, Azeri people chose to leave Armenia? Or um, was there pressure that you're aware of from, like, nationalist pressure from within Armenia to push Azeris out because of conflicts like this? Oh, you know, I will say something not very 
patriotical, <laughs> but of course there were Tur Azer Azeri villages in Armenia, uh, Azeri settlements in Armenia, and Armenian settlements and villages in Azerbaijan. But um, and uh, in the end of 1980s, with collapse of Soviet Union, with uh, the Karabakh uh, issue, uh, of course. Um, Many Armenians came to Armenia, many Azeri went to Azerbaijan, but there is uh, one, one very important point that uh, no zero Azeri got murdered because he is Azeri in Armenia. But uh, there were pogroms in Azerbaijan and they just killed hundreds, thousands of Armenians just because they are Armenians. Uh, as a reference, uh, there were pogroms in Sumgait, in Baku, in 1988 and 1989. It was a genocide. It is not called genocide, but it is. And uh, because of uh, these uh, things, Armenians just hate Gorbachev <laughs> because he just uh, could stop everything with a no, couple of tanks and Soviet army because Soviet Union was still alive, but he did nothing because he was afraid uh, of Armenian people and uh, all that uh, talks about independence and uh, Karabakh. Mm. And uh, also uh, in some pre-border areas, uh, there are still some uh, Azeri villages. So they are totally empty from that times, but... Uh, for example, their houses, their graves, they are untouched. It is just an empty village, just a cultural point. But uh, when Azeri come to Armenian villages, they are destroying graves for, firstly. As a as a genocidal erasure of like Yeah, and cultural thing also. No cultural yeah. genocide and uh, it is not a uh, Armenian propaganda <laughs> it is uh, uh, based on facts <laughs> yeah does that seem like I mean this is a long time of, of this sort of activity happening from the Azerbaijani military does this seem like from what you can I know it's got to be hard to tell when there's such a history of conflict between the two countries but I haven't heard about any sort of protests in Azerbaijan against the military activities like this, does it seem like it's a pretty well approved thing by a lot of the population in that country? Uh, well, Azerbaijan is a dictatorship and uh, of course they have very strong propaganda, uh, but uh, I, I know uh, that uh, most of population, they are just silent and they are very poor to think about political things. For example, most of population just think how to buy a new fridge, then think about something political. Of course, they have some dissidents, uh, they have uh, activists uh, who are against Aliyev regime, uh, but uh, their dictatorship is even more harder than in Russia. They have no voice. And uh, we were monitoring some Azeri press to find something uh, anti-war articles, and we found an anything. You didn't. You didn't find anything. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that one part of the uh, Soviet legacy in the region was the creation of ethnic republics as a part of their idea of national liberation, and you know, within the Soviet framework and self-representation within a Soviet framework, whether or not that actually happened is a different question. But where that border between those two so Soviet republics, between the Armenian one and the Azerbaijan one fell, is that a product of Soviet map making? And is the sort of conflict now around that line on the map because there were people that you know who are Azeri living in this area and there were Armenian people living in this area like prior to the Soviet the Soviet Union were there recognized territories where it was just like this is where our people live or was were people pretty commingling in the area well <laughs> just uh 
in Sovi inside of so Soviet Union, there were 15 republics, but uh, there wasn't uh, official borders inside of them. You could just uh, move around all that republics free uh, without any checkings, like inside of uh, European Union now. If you are a citizen of, for example, Germany, you just can free travel inside of all European Union. But yes, uh, Soviet government and some leaders, so they're just uh, making uh, very wrong decisions to giving part of one republic, in brackets republic, to another one, because they were believing that it will make Soviet Union more um, firm and uh, no one, no republic want to uh, get independent because they have their part uh, inside of other republic. For example, uh, issue of the Crimea, it raised because of Khrushchev just gave part of Ukraine to Russian uh, re Soviet Republic. In fact, uh, there was uh, it wasn't issue in 1950s because it was still w one country and it doesn't matter, but it uh, got his its effect in nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, because one one of uh, Putin's uh, arguments was that uh, historically Crimea was part of Russia. It was Khrushchev who gave it to Ukraine, and uh, same with Karabakh. Like officially in Soviet Union, it was called the uh, Autonomous uh, Kar Nagorno Karabakh Republic, but the uh, Yure it was in inside of Azerbaijani your Soviet Republic. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like, I mean, and Putin is also saying that Ukraine was a part of, you know, Russia before too. So, um, and it was very bad, uh, colonial moves to keep it, uh, one country, but it made uh, various problems. For example, same here in Georgia that, uh, Abkhazia, Ossetia, they were, you know, historically Georgian lands, but, uh, Stalin or some, some someone in Soviet Union gave them inside of Russia autonomy. Mm -hmm. And now we have what we have. Yeah. Can you talk about the apparent motivation of Azerbaijan in this territorial grab and ethnic cleansing? Uh, do you get the impression that this is because of a rising ethnic nationalism inside the region? Or is it more the the just power grab by the dictatorship there? No, only motivation of Azerbaijan is uh, propaganda, is to have their victories and uh, stay in power with their clan. As you know, Aliyev is uh, son of his father, Gidar Aliyev, who was a president of Azerbaijan from 1990s. And he, even in Soviet Union, he was uh, one of the leaders of uh, Azerbaijan and he just stayed in power. And it is uh, one of the... Um, inherited uh, dicta dictatorships in uh, post-Soviet countries. And as uh, every dictatorship, they need their victories to stay in power. Can you talk about the impacts inside of Armenia of the last 30 years of blockade of Armenia um, by Turkey and Azerbaijan, and maybe a little bit about what that looks like? Well, uh, after collapse of Soviet Union in 1990s, Armenia was in war with uh, Azerbaijan, first uh, Karabakh war. And uh, from 1991 to 1995, uh, Armenia was in a blockade. It means that uh, there was no gas, no electricity, uh, no bread. And uh, my parents were very young at that time and they are they don't like to tell about that times because uh, it's very humiliating. Uh, and uh, now in uh, year one, in 1990s, people got less bread than in uh, Leningrad during World War II. As I understand, there's still a continued blockade because of the conflicts with Azerbaijan, but also that the borders along Turkey have also continued to be closed or hard to import and export over. And the only, this is what I read at least, and I, I could be totally misunderstanding it, but that the only land border 
that seems to really be open at this point consistently is one with Iran. Is that correct? Uh, we have two open borders in the north uh, with Georgia and in the south with Iran. Okay. And uh, in the east and west, it is closed because there are Turkey and Azerbaijan. Like, well, first, can you talk about the, maybe what you understand of being the motivations of why Turkey is closing the border? Has there been a, a renewed conflict with Turkey? Uh, I don't know how, how much it is officially known, but uh, no, Turkey is an ally of Azerbaijan. And uh, it was saying everything to um, turn Azerbaijan more to Turkey than to Russia because of uh, Soviet legacy, it was very important to them. And uh, because they have a pretty same culture, pretty same language, and ethnically they are very familiar. And as you know, there was no such country as Azerbaijan before 1918. Uh, it was just part of uh, Ottoman Empire uh, and later just Turkey. Mm. And uh, as I know, I can, I can be wrong, <laughs> you can Google. Uh, Turkey even does does not recognize Armenia as an independent uh, state, and uh, it. Um, I don't know about that, but I know for hundred percent that Turkey doesn't uh, recognize uh, genocide. Yeah, and yeah. there's no diplomatic uh, issues. Nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's a big internet. There's been a big international push for the recognition um, that's over like of the genocide that's over a hundred years old that they still ideologically refuse to identify. So you've talked about how there was a big pulling together of NGOs in response to the recent war in Artsakh uh, and the expulsion of Armenian people from there. As I understand, the Armenian government didn't respond, didn't offer to send in troops or threaten to send in troops. And I've heard from some places that maybe because the Armenian military and government is sort of uh, still still sort of recovering from the second Karabakh war. But can you talk a little bit about, like, was there a response militarily or humanitarily inside of Armenia with helping the folks that were escaping and sort of how people feel about the the lack of government response? Oh, it's a very hard question and uh, sorry if I will be too emotional. No, after uh, Second Karabakh War, uh, one of the point of uh, treaty was uh, that uh, no more Armenian army will be in uh, Karabakh. And uh, all that uh, 30 years, uh, it was kind of uh, one country because uh, Karabakh people had uh, Armenian passports, they speak uh, Armenian, they have everything Armenian, like uh, Armenian money, Armenian schools. Uh, they could free come to Yerevan, and uh, there were free places for Artsakh people in universities, in schools, and it was considering as uh, one country just divided by some political issues. Uh, but, uh, of course, our political leaders were doing uh, all wrong, as it turned out, uh, because our second and third uh, presidents, uh, Robert Kocharan and Serge Sarkisian, originally were from Karabakh, uh, they, and they became famous during First Karabakh uh, War. And uh, so their reputation was connected with it. And uh, they mm, remained everything uh, such uncertain to stay in power, to say, oh, if we go Karabakh, we will lose Karabakh. But it uh, doesn't work because uh, you know, we had a, a revolution, we changed the government, uh, but uh, the first days of revolution, Nikol Pashinyan, our current uh, prime minister, said that uh, Karabakh is still Armenia, it is ours, and uh, he won't let it down. And uh, then happened the uh, Second Karabakh War, and uh, uh, of course it was a big national tragedy, but uh, we couldn't know, we couldn't guess that everything will become even worse. Mm. 
because uh, at that time we had many refugees too and uh, of course government did nothing uh, all that uh, NGOs were gathering uh, some humanitarian aid uh, they were helping uh, to poorest families to find jobs to find houses and now uh, when uh, during blockade uh, nothing was done from Armenian side uh, and uh, I know that uh, that NGO that I was volunteering for, it's called the Armenian Food Bank, that uh, president of that NGO, he uh, took uh, 12 tons of uh, food to blockade its Tepanakert, and it was uh, totally illegal. He just crossed uh, two borders illegally through forests and mountains, and uh, he delivered that uh, food to blockade the uh, Karabakh. And uh, when uh, at uh, September 19, Azari army started to uh, bombing uh, Stepanakert, Armenian army did nothing. And uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan was starting to give uh, press confer conferences that uh, it is uh, all fault of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic uh, government and uh, Armenia will do nothing with this and uh, actually there's no connection between us which is totally um, a lie because uh, Karabakh's uh, government uh, it was uh, mm, it is consisting uh, Armenians and uh, they are uh, approved by Yerevan always all these 30 years um, and in the uh, first days, when we were collecting all that humanitarian aid, uh, police came to us and uh, was saying, oh, you're making uh, it worse, you're mm, making panic. And uh, they wanted to government to uh, do mm, that collections of humanitarian aid. And uh, it was very uh, suspicious because uh, government... Uh, will do did and will do nothing as always and uh, even with uh, refugees uh, of second karabakh war they are still you know alive because of that uh, ngos not government government uh, let them down and will let them down now everything which is done is done uh, uh, without government <laughs> Is the the mutual aid or is the like humanitarian aid that's organized? Um, is the volunteering and such done by religious groups or by international nonprofits, by leftist groups? Uh, what does that look like? Uh, I would say uh, there are many volunteers from uh, Red Cross, and uh, they were helping people who just arrived to Armenia. Uh, but uh, what I participated in too, it is uh, Armenian Food Bank and uh, it is founded by a Canadian Armenian who returned to repatriate it to Armenia because of patriotic feelings. And um, like many of volunteers are uh, Russian immigrants, but uh, there is nothing uh, with uh, religious or leftists. I think that... Uh, it's just about uh, human nature and cooperation. Of course, it, we can find the roots uh, of cooperation in anarchism, but uh, it was just uh, ev everything uh, kind and good which uh, you can find in human nature don't, without considering any political uh, side. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not ideological. Yeah, it was uh, just call of the heart <laughs> for everyone and big, big empathy. Yeah, that's important. That's a good thing that's there. I know it's kind of a complicated geopolitical situation concerning neighboring states and regional powers, such as we've talked about Turkey, um, but also Russia and I, like Armenia is in a military pact uh, treaty organization with Russia. And Russia was supposed to be peacekeeping at the border region per uh, an agreement with Azerbaijan. And also there's the, you know, the issue of like relations to international powers like France or like the USA. And, you know, I, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about 
if you have any insights into how the the geopolitics kind of featured into how this worked out, like it makes sense for Russia to not engage militarily as a part of that treaty organization because the Armenian government wasn't calling for any sort of reaction. But also as peacekeepers, it sounds kind of like they haven't done anything about Azerbaijan breaking truce be- like after the second war. But as I understand, Armenia has also been engaging with the war in Ukraine by offering aid and also has started doing military practices with the U.S. And so that's probably caused a complication in the relationship with Russia. Uh, I don't know if you have anything that you could say about this. Yeah, any perspectives? Well, (laughs) I'm not a a political expert, but uh, I'll say what I know. Uh, Speaking about France and uh, other uh, European countries, we have a saying in Armenia, if uh, some of French presidents are uh, helping Armenia or saying about Armenia, it uh, means that uh, they have presidential elections soon and they just want to have Armenian diaspora's votes. And uh, also... France is uh, in the NATO and uh, who is in NATO too? Turkey. And end of the uh, any conversation. (laughs) And uh, except of that, France is too far. France uh, does not much have interest in our region. Uh, Only country, only person that had a personal interest in our region is uh, Vladimir Putin. Because of his uh, imperial uh, ambitions, which are you know, <laughs> very wrong, but they were, and they were protecting us of all these problems for 30 years. <laughs> uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, Armenian government is blaming Russia, Russia peacekeepers, the Russian government, that uh, they don't protect us. But come on, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't protect the <laughs> Russian government, but it is not uh, some uh, Santa Claus that will just come and help us whenever we need to. For it is not, uh, it is very childish uh, position to believe that there is some, someone that is uh, just happy to help us just because we are little and weak. <laughs> now we can. Uh, from first days in power, Nikol Pashinyan was uh, uh, making relations with Russia worse and worse, knowing that it is uh, one of the uh, currents of our national security. Uh, he, Of course, he was free to do that, but he did it because it was very popular uh, among population and uh, he could do it if we have a very strong army like uh, Israel, <laughs> but uh, we have nothing to to do uh, against uh, Turkey or Azerbaijan. And we have had and have very weak army. We, ha- we are very bad in diplomacy. We have no big uh, reputation. And uh, now, of course, uh, Russia and Russian peacekeepers were doing. Um, Mistakes, but it is their mistakes, not ours. I'm asking question to Nikol Pashinyan, not to Putin. <laughs> he has his own uh, position. <laughs> that makes sense in terms of the pre-existing relationship with with Russia. With Russia, but if the prime minister is reacting to some degree of public opinion and souring the relationship with Russia, and currently has been not only engaging with um, sending aid to Ukraine, but also doing military exercises with the U.S. The U.S. is also a member of NATO alongside of alongside of Turkey. And while there's like conflicts, like I just had a conversation with some people who had just come back from Rojava, like there's obviously conflicts in some ways with Turkey around Turkey's relationship in the region that are geopolitical and not ideological that the US has parts of the parts of the US government it's a very complicated state but but i wonder like are there feelings about 
that in terms of sidling up to or working alongside of just just making making uh your very large neighbor possibly angry uh and sidling up to a power that is friendly with another one of your neighbors that has doesn't recognize the existence of the genocide that they committed or the the border that's there um how people are reacting to that does that make sense yeah totally and uh the, like Pashinyan did every single mistake that was uh, that was on his way. <laughs> he spoiled every single chance because all that uh, military military things with uh, France or US. They, at the end, they will do. They will give us nothing, and uh, we're just fucked up. <laughs> And uh, there are very big uh, concerns in nowadays in the Armenian population that uh, in a couple of years, uh, Azerbaijan will start a massive war with Armenia itself, and uh, we have no more allies. Yeah, that seems rather scary. Well, do you have views on how listeners can um, support the people that were displaced from Karabakh? from internationally if there are any i guess there's the red cross but i don't know if there's any other you said the armenian food bank seems like an organization that's doing a lot to get people food and supplies that they need uh who are displaced and living inside of armenia are there ways that you would suggest that anarchists or or sympathetic people internationally can help I will advise uh, two foundations. One of them is uh, Armenian Food Bank, uh, which was uh, created by Armenia, Canadian Armenian. And uh, I know for sure that all help is uh, going to people and they receive it. And also the Michael Katikan, the founder of um, Armenian Food Bank, he's not an anarchist, but he broke uh, international law, he broke to to countries law to uh, cross borders and uh, bring uh, food to blockade it uh, city <laughs> it is quite anarchist <laughs> move i i think that a part of anarchism is a, a part of our strength is by getting a better understanding of sympathetic people or with other anarchists in other areas and hearing their perspectives that's one point of having this conversation is to so that i can learn from you and so that uh, the audience can learn from your experience. Are there any resources or groups that you would point us to that are speaking about organizing or ideas coming from your region or uh, news updates, anything like that, that people could pay attention to? Well, um, we have a little uh, channel in Signal, <laughs> but uh, we are... Um... I think only people who are in Armenia and who we, we know uh, personally in terms of uh, you know security, because uh, most of guys who uh, who are from Russia they, they are uh, judged uh, and uh, repressed. That's why they are not in Russia anymore. Uh, but uh, I talked uh, to guys from Crime Think and. Uh, I will write, uh, and me and my group, our group, we will write uh, articles about the situation in Armenia, about anarchism roots in Armenia. And uh, if someone is interested, uh, I'm, I will write articles for, for Crime Think and uh, they can catch, catch up there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that you want to talk about? I think it was all. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for this conversation and for speaking in English. I really appreciate it. Uh, you did a great job. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for questions you prepared. It was uh, very accurate, uh, very empathetic. And I guess uh, our listeners will enjoy our conversation. I hope so. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Cooper Andrews went by the nickname Harris. He was a former Marine and a wilderness firefighter from Cleveland, Ohio. Finbar Cafferkey was from Ireland and had served with the YPG in Rojava. Dmitry Petrov, known as Ilya Leshy, was from Russia. The three of them had two critical things in common. 
They all three self-identified as anarchists, and they all three made the choice to go to Ukraine where they fought against the Russian invasion. Harris, Finbar, and Dmitry died on April 19th in a battle near Bakhmut. Crimethink.com has postings about them, including a eulogy for Harris from his comrades and writings of his describing his motives for fighting in Ukraine. You can also read an interview with Finbar and listen to a song of his. Of the three of them, there's a great deal more background now about Dmitry, and his life story reads like a comic book. Originally from Russia, Dmitry was involved with the anarcho-communist combat organization, the Resistance Committee, and Solidarity Collectives. He was an anti-fascist, fighting Nazis in the streets of Moscow, and planning clandestine actions under the banner of the People's Retribution. He was well-versed in sabotage and in bullets and bombs, and he was also a theoretical thinker, responsible for a number of thoughtful articles and posts about the anarchist struggle. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, Dmitry was there, attempting to coordinate with Ukrainian and Belarusian anarchists to form an explicitly anarchist and anti-state community defense militia. The goal was for the unit to be independent from the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainian state. In July 2022, Dmitry wrote an analysis of the anti-authoritarian platoon, discussing and evaluating its successes and failures. It is quite informative in terms of how well the model in Rojava can be duplicated and reproduced elsewhere. Unfortunately, the Ukrainian state was highly uncomfortable with independent and autonomous groups running around with guns, and they ultimately gave an ultimatum. Anyone who wanted to fight would have to be integrated into the Ukrainian military. Thus, anarchists like Harris, Finbar, and Dmitry were not permitted to maintain their own autonomous unit and made the choice instead to remain and to fight. Not long before their deaths on April 19th, Dmitry had communicated to others his intention of leaving the state-affiliated unit he was in in order to again attempt to form an anti-authoritarian unit. In July, at an international anarchist gathering in Switzerland, Dmitry's father was on hand to receive recognition on Dmitry's behalf. But in the midst of that, a contingent of anarchists shouted their objections. Their position, it seems, is that it is not anarchist to fight and to die as part of a state military. And by their conception of things, Harris, Finbar, and Dmitry were not engaged in anarchist action and therefore should not be celebrated. This raises an interesting tension. Probably, there's little controversy as to whether anarchists can engage in sabotage. That's widely accepted. Monkey wrenching any nation state is unquestionably acceptable. Going into exile is readily acceptable too. Any anarchist in a combat zone can simply choose to pack up and leave. And going back to the Spanish Civil War, anarchists have regularly formed up their own anti-authoritarian units, fighting independent of any state government. Although, as in the example of Spain, the anarchist units expended far more bullets firing at the fascist forces than they probably ever expended firing at socialists. But the controversy arises in the absence of explicitly anarchist guerrilla units or when state authorities render such formations impossible. Can anarchists allow themselves to be incorporated into the hierarchical military structure of a nation state? without sacrificing anarchist principles, without becoming, essentially, a hierarch sellout. Some situations we can ask what constitutes a nation-state, Rojava, the Zapatista Autonomous Zone, the West Bank or Gaza Strip, whether the traditional concept of government really exists there is up for debate. But in Ukraine, it isn't. Ukraine is a nation-state, and a corrupt one at that. And on top of it, it's the nation-state that gave anarchists the ultimatum to integrate into the state forces or put down their arms. Given that choice, 
It's pretty easy for an anarchist to tell the state to go fuck itself. I could imagine that if I were in that position, I could pack up and go. But the question isn't what I would do. It could be that Harris, Finbar, and Dimitri had more compassion and empathy for the Ukrainian people they saw displaced and bombed and killed. It could be that in weighing out competing priorities, the value of innocent life compelled them to hold their noses and accept an ultimatum that stunk. I don't think the question is whether others must meet my purest ideal of what anarchism is, but whether, as anarchists, any of us have the right to demand that others do what we think we would do if we were them. I have a hard time imagining that I can sit here in the comfort of my first world life and throw shade on others who at least attempted to do more than I've done even if they did it in a way that I might not have done it. We each have only one life, and so we have to make it count. We also only have one death, and so we have to make that count too. Harris, Finbar, and Dimitri lived their one life, and they died their one death. Their lives and death counted for something. The rest of us can only hope the same will one day be said for us. This is Anarchist Prisoner, Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're making your life and death count for something, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road. Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.nologs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.